speaker. Uh, thanks to his good work and the work of the Smead Foundation. So the center is now located here on the campus of NNU. Uh, we're going into our third year and serving as an educational resource for the continual exploration of these important liberties, economic, political, and religious. It's a student organization, and I encourage you to look at the students' work, such as their book reviews that are on our website, csma.nnu.edu, as well as this, uh, the work that they're doing, the research they're doing on economic freedom. For example, we have a student supporting Amman, Jordan, uh, this semester, studying the labor market for Syrian refugees. So just a lot of good work going on uh, with regards to economic freedom. So again, we're, we're thankful for the Smead Foundation and the support of this center at NNU, and thankful uh, that we can bring uh, such a distinguished speaker uh, to you tonight. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Michael Tanner, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Mr. Tanner's research there at Cato focuses on poverty and social welfare policy. Under his direction, the Cato has launched the Project on Social Security Choice. The uh, magazine, the Congressional Quarterly, has named Mr. Tanner one of the nation's five most influential experts on Social Security. His uh, writings and research and work has been published in almost all major, or most every American newspaper, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, and the Wall Street Journal. You can find his weekly column at the National Review online. <laughs> Mike is the author of numerous books on public policy, including the Epithon on the right, How Big Government Conservatism brought, brought Down the Republican Revolution, and also The Poverty of Welfare, Helping Others in a C Civil Society. And now most recently, his book, which you received tonight, Going for Growth, Deficits, Debt, and the Entitlement Crisis, which he'll be speaking on tonight. Join me in welcoming Mike Tank. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate your having me out here. Uh, first time I've been down in this part of uh, Idaho, so I really appreciate the chance to see it. It's beautiful. And I thank all of you for coming out as well. Uh, for those of you who are students, I have to say, uh, college has sure changed since I was there because there is absolutely no way I would have been on a beautiful night like tonight listening to an economics, economics lecture. So clearly something, something has changed. Um, but I also, I, I want to ask all of you to bear with me a little bit tonight on this. Uh, I'm going to try something different. Uh, I've been told, and I, and I guess they must have caused some of my earlier lectures on, on tape or something, I've been told that my talk is a little bit, well, depressing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I said, okay, I knew it was kind of a downer, but they said, look, we have to start taking people's belts and shoelaces away, and it's just, you know. <laughs> so they asked me if I could be a little more upbeat about it tonight. And I'm going to try that. So I'm going to try and be kind of a glass half full kind of guy. And so this is brand new. I mean, I haven't tried it like this, so I'm going to ask you to just kind of bear with me as I try to be, you know, happy-go-lucky and positive about the national's death. <laughs> but I don't you know. We'll, we'll see how it goes on that. So let me, if I can, start us off with a little bit of good news. And that is that... That is you don't have to watch my slides. <laughs> There we go. The good news is that this uh, last year, the federal budget deficit was $435 billion. Now, no, that really is good news. Because if you look at this slide here, just about five years ago, the federal deficit was $1.4 trillion. So really, getting it down to $435 billion is real progress. I mean, they, they actually accomplished something in Washington today. Now, you know, there's several reasons why, and a lot of it has to do with sort of this one-time artificial spike you see here. Uh, that, was, that was a few special things that went into that spike. Remember the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, you know, bailed out the banks and the auto industry and all of that? Well, that was a one-time expenditure to do all those sort of things, and some of that money was actually paid back. 
that portion that's going to be paid back has largely been paid back. And by the way, just to give you an idea how the Washington works, you might think that when they pay back that money, that would be revenue for the government. It's actually negative spending. Only in Washington can they get away with that. I mean, just try to lump some night and negatively spend your money and see where it gets you. But, but that is negative spending in Washington. But that's, that was a one-time thing, and it's just done and, and over with. Then there was also stimulus. You might all remember there was the, President Obama pushed through the $800 billion stimulus. It was a big political deal at the time. There was actually five different stimulus bills, three under President Bush and two under President Obama, and they totaled one and a half trillion dollars between those five stimulus bills. And again, that was sort of a one-time expenditure. They, they, they've sort of run out now of shovel-ready jobs. And so they're no longer spending that money. So we now have those savings, I guess. Uh, we've come out of the recession. And you know, even though we've got pretty anemic economic growth, when you have any growth at all, that means there's more revenue for the government that comes in from taxes on that growth. So that, that's helped. Uh, there was a tax hike a couple of years ago. They did away with the top tax cuts, uh, the top of the Bush tax cuts, so we got rid of those, and that, that brought in a little bit more for the revenue for the federal government. And then finally, of course, for a couple of years, we have what was called the sequester, which was a limit on the growth rate of domestic discretionary and defense discretionary spending. A lot of people said it was a cut. It was not really a cut. We, the, the spending actually grew every year, but it grew slower than economic growth. So it actually held down the, the growth compared to what money that was coming in, and that can also save money. You put all that together, and you end up with going from 1.4 trillion down to 435 billion dollars. And believe me, in Washington, they've been celebrating this. Uh, they practically, you know, dislocated the shoulder, patting themselves on the back. Uh, you know, if any of you read Paul Krugman. Uh, he has written 437 different columns, uh, all explaining that the deficit problem has been mostly solved. Uh, every second Tuesday, you can find one in the New York Times if you're looking for it. Uh, another very influential columnist, Matt Iglesias, writes for a, a blog called Vox. Uh, don't worry if you haven't heard of Vox. No one outside the Beltway has ever heard of Vox, but everybody inside the Beltway has read it. I mean, not that we live in a bubble or anything. But everybody reads that uh, out there. And Matt Iglesias is very concerned that the deficit is too low. And in fact, he wants us to hurry up and get out there and create a bigger deficit. He says the fate of the economy depends on having a deficit, and we need to hurry up and get one uh, out there. Uh, another one of my favorites is every year when the president introduces his budget, there is a briefing by an, an anonymous official was always the Treasury Secretary. <laughs> and this anonymous Treasury Secretary this year said that well, now that we beat the deficit, the age of austerity is over. Now, this is something else you might be able to help me with. Maybe after the lecture, if somebody has actually seen an age of austerity, if they would come up and let me know. <clears throat> I quite possibly fell asleep and just kind of missed it. And, you know, I blinked or something and it went by. I've been searching for it. I've checked belt cartons and all of that. But, but somewhere there was an age of austerity, and it's now over. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. So they're celebrating pocketing the champagne in Washington. And it's just one kind of tiny problem with all that. And that is this respite from the deficit is very, very short-lived. In fact, this chart from the Congressional Budget Office shows this is that point that's on about 435 billion last year. This year we're already up to 550 billion dollars in deficit. So we've added another 120 billion dollars in deficit this year. Uh, and in fact, if you look at where the Congressional Budget Office says we're going to be, in 10 years, we're back to more than one trillion dollar deficits every year. So back to those days of trillion dollar deficits every single year. And in fact, it doesn't get any better after that. It just keeps getting higher and higher and higher after that. You want to keep going out there, you get two trillion, three trillion dollar deficits in the out years as you keep going out. Now, 
probably should mention a little bit about what the deficit is. The deficit is how much you overspend this year. One year's overspending, one year's profligacy. And frankly, to be totally honest about it, being over one year is not the end of the world. I mean, you'd rather not do it. But you know, think about your own budget. You know, you prefer to just live on what you bring in. But sometimes, you know, there's a real great party on Saturday night, and you, know, you just need to spend a little bit more than you have. I mean, that's why God invented credit cards, right? And the same thing is true with the government. Things are going to happen. There's going to be a natural disaster. There's going to be a war. We're going to have a recession. And sometimes you're going to a lot of budget. But just like with your own budget, while you can do that, get away with that once in a while, if you do that week after week, month after month, year after year, pretty soon you got a problem. And the same is true with the federal government. If it runs a deficit one year, well, we'd rather not, but we can live with it. If you do that year after year after year, you got a problem. And if you take those deficits from each year, and you add them together, so you have one year's profligacy and a deficit, combine all that one year profligacies into a whole bunch of profligacy, and what you end up with is the federal debt. And the federal debt right now is about $19.5 trillion. And if you look at where it's going to go from here, that, like the deficits, are just going to get higher and higher higher every year. In fact, about 10 years, that 19 half trillion is going to be somewhere in excess of $27 trillion in debt. And just to give you a better idea of what this means, right now that 19 and a half trillion dollar debt is equal to 103% of our gross domestic product. That means we now have a debt bigger than the value of everything that's produced in this country over the course of a year. That's a little bit like having your credit card bills be higher than your entire pre-tax salary. You've probably got a problem at that point. And clearly we have a debt problem when we owe more than everything we produce in this country. And I'll put it in a bigger perspective. Because you hear a lot about the crisis in Europe, the Euro debt crisis, you know, Greece and all, all of that. Well, if you want to look at that perspective, we are actually better off than Greece. Yay. <laughs> but you know what? We're not all that much better off. We're, okay, we're better than Italy and, and Belgium's a little worse. But hey, we're worse off than France. France. <laughs> We're worse than the average for the entire EU. So when they talk about the Euro debt crisis, the European debt crisis, all of the sovereign debt problem in Europe, we're worse. I, you know, I'm not sure that's something we should be really proud of. Ah, I can't do this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been positive and upbeat all I can do. I, 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 just, I, I give up. I gotta give you some bad news. Because as bad as these numbers are, and they're plenty bad, they're really much worse. Let me tell you just how bad these things really get. Because when you start talking about the national debt, there really are three kinds of debt that you have to pay attention to. The first of these is what's called debt held by the public. Now right now, debt held by the public is just about $14 trillion. So who's the public that's holding this debt? You are. About 60% of this debt is held by Americans. If you have a pension fund or a 401k program that's invested in government bonds, that's the debt. You're holding part of that debt. In fact, if you bought, if you bought a savings bond when you were a kid, you're the public holding part of that debt. 
and I'd say about 60% of that is held by Americans. About 40% of that debt is held by foreign countries. And the two largest foreign countries that hold that debt are China and Japan, and they each hold 9% of the debt. Now, economists worry most, of all the types of debt, they worry most about this debt held by the public. And they do that for a couple of reasons. One is, someone actually holds that debt. That means we actually owe that money to someone. Someday we have to make good on that debt. If you have a 10-year bond, in 10 years it comes due, and we actually have to make good on that bond and redeem it. So it's a very solid debt. Now, I know in reality what we do is we roll the debt over, we borrow somewhere else, and we, we just kind of trade it off. But, but in theory, at least, it's a very real solid debt. Second, if you want to get the, you know, if you want to get people to buy those bonds, you actually have to offer them something for it. And that's interest. You have to pay interest on those bonds. Now, right now, we pay very little. People are willing to lend us money at absurdly low rates. We pay about 1.5% uh, interest rates on those bonds. Now, why are they willing to lend us the money so cheap? Well, frankly, where else are they going to put it? You know, the euro is not such a great bet right now. Nobody's getting rich off the remembi. The ruble's not burning up the currency markets. We're the fastest horse in the glue factory. <laughs> but even so, even so, we're still spending a ton of money on debt, on interest. About, about $350 billion every year, the federal government pays an interest on the debt. And that's the fastest rising spending program of the federal government right now is interest on the debt. It's growing faster than anything else the federal government does. And interest doesn't buy you anything. I mean, I don't care if you're a liberal and you want to spend more money on education and social welfare programs, or you're conservative and you want to buy more planes and tanks. You're not getting any of that for interest payments on the debt. That's simply sunk money. You know, just like your credit card bills. You don't get that big screen TV for the interest payments. That's just money you're paying the bank. That's money that's going out every month that's not buying you anything. And the same is true with the federal government. And that's at the absurdly low rates we're paying. Historically, we paid 4 to 5 percent interest. So what happens if we have to start, you know, people lose, lose a little faith in us, or there gets to be some better alternatives out there, and we have to start paying a little more interest. You know, for every 1% increase in the interest rates, we would have to pay another $120 billion every year in interest payments. So we better hope that the rest of the world stays messed up, and people still lend us money cheap. And then finally, people worry about debt held by the public because, well, there's competition out there. If the government's going to, if you're going to buy a government bond, let's say, or your pension fund's going to buy a government bond, that means they're not buying a corporate bond. You know, there's only so many investment, you know, so much money out there to invest. And if they're investing in a government bond, you're not investing in other types of bonds. That means you be, you're in competition with those corporate bonds, with private sector bonds. You begin to squeeze out private borrowing. You make it harder for corporations to borrow money if they want to build a new factory or hire more workers or raise wages or whatever it might be. You begin to squeeze out that private sector borrowing. So for all these reasons, people really are concerned about the amount of debt held by the public. Now right now, that's about $14 trillion. There's another kind of debt that's out there, and that's called intragovernmental debt. And this is debt that one part of the government owes to another part of the government. And essentially what we're talking about here are trust funds. Now you've all heard about the Social Security Trust Fund, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit in depth about the Social Security Trust Fund later, but there's actually a bunch of them. In fact, there's over a hundred trust funds that the federal government has. There's the Medicare Trust Fund, 
the highway trust fund where your gas taxes supposedly go, there's a Gulf oil spill trust fund, and on and on and on. And they all work essentially the same way. They all hold special issue bonds. These are bonds just like the bonds that are held by the public, except they're not traded by the public. You can't go out and buy a social security bond. And what they are is essentially an obligation that the federal government has to these programs that it has to make good on some to some day. Now, right now, there's a total, for example, Social Security, about $2.9 trillion in these bonds in the Social Security Trust Fund. And all together, if you put all these together, there's about $5.5 trillion in trust fund bonds that are out there. Now, these bonds, you know, a, they're in debt. If you're going to pay Social Security benefits, you're going to have to redeem the bonds in the Social Security Trust Fund, right? or the Medicare Trust Fund, or whatever it's going to be. So you're going to have to pay them someday, so just like they held in the public, they're a real debt. Now, the government can play a few more games with it, but so it's not quite as hard as the, as the debt held in the public, but it's still a solid debt. And unlike debt held in the public, the government's going to buy its own bonds, so they don't have to pay, they have to pay interest on it, but they don't have to compete for what that interest is. They can just set whatever rate of interest they want to set on it. And interestingly, by the way, they pay that interest more bond. So it's a little bit like having an IOU that earns interest. You pay the interest by writing another IOU on it. But, uh, so you have to assess that. And you're not competing with the private sector for this type of debt because it's, they, you can't buy these bonds. So it's not quite as bad as debt on the public, but it's still a pretty solid debt, right? You add that five and a half trillion to the 14 trillion, and what do you get? 19 and a half trillion dollars. And that's the national debt. So whenever you hear the media or politicians talking about the national debt, that's what they're talking about. It's a combination of debt held by the public plus intergovernmental debt. Those two combined together is the official national debt. Now, there's another type of debt out there that is just as important and it's often overlooked. And this is the implicit debt, or the unfunded liabilities, or the unfunded obligations of programs like Social Security and Medicare. You know, on these programs, we're obligated to pay benefits in the future. And we can tell roughly how much we're gonna to have to pay. I mean, we can look out in the future and we can say, we know how many people are gonna be retired, let's say, in 20 years. And we know what the law says you have to pay each of those retirees. So we can figure out how much the program is going to cost. And we also can tell roughly how much money is going to come in in taxes to pay for those programs. You know, we can figure out sort of how many people are going to be working. Roughly, we can take a guess at what their wages will be. And then we know what the tax rate is going to be on those, those folks. This, is a, by the way, is a University of Idaho PowerPoint. <laughs> Well, there's a gap between what we're going to have to pay and the amount of money we know is going to be coming in in taxes to pay. And that gap is the implicit debt or unfunded obligations or unfunded liabilities of those programs. And that's a debt because the law says you have to pay those benefits. And if you don't have the money, you got a problem. Now, right now, that unfunded obligation, that debt for Social Security, is $32 trillion. $32 trillion. And that, I don't know if there's any accounting folks out here or other people who really need to get a life. But, <laughs> no. but, but to understand what this, this next part is, but this is what's called the discounted present value over an infinite horizon. See why I mean that? But what that means is if you took $32 trillion today and you put it in the bank, it ain't earned 3% interest forever. Then you'd have enough money to pay that entire unfunded liability forever. <coughs> the only problem is the federal government doesn't have $32 trillion lying around right now. So we're a little short. <coughs> That's Social Security. Medicare is in worse shape than Social Security. Social Security is the easy lifting. Medicare is about $55 trillion in unfunded liabilities. 
Well, you add that together, and you got about 87 trillion. <coughs> you know, and there's about a trillion dollars going playing around in civil service pensions that are underfunded, and there's some military programs that are under, underfunded, and so on. But you add it all up, and you got about 87 trillion. Throw in the 19 and a half trillion or so, 20 trillion that we have on top of that, and you're up to somewhere around 97 trillion dollars in debt. And look, what's a trillion between friends? So why don't we round it off and call it an 800 trillion dollars? So that's what we really owe in this country: is 100 trillion dollars. And for your students, I know there's a lot of worry about student debt. Now, guys are worried how you're going to pay off your debt when you get out of here and all that sort of stuff. Your share of that hundred trillion dollars is five to six times as much as the average student debt in this country. And it's just as big a debt for you guys because you're ultimately going to have to pay the taxes that are going to pay off that debt. So if you really want to worry about the debt, worry about that. Because it's a lot more. All right, so that's the problem. <laughs> what are we going to do about it? And frankly, folks, this isn't rocket science. You know, you got more money going out than you got coming in. There's only a couple of things you can do about it. You work on getting in more money, or lots having less going out. <laughs> Anybody got a third idea? I'm willing to hear it. So let's start with more coming in. <clears throat> because if you listen to the political debate, there are some folks out there on one side of this debate who say the answer is we need to raise taxes. And of course, when we talk about raising taxes, nobody really wants to raise taxes on everybody. Because they don't want to raise taxes on a lot of people who vote. So we're only going to raise taxes on small groups like the rich. Now, if the rich only paid their fair share, we wouldn't have a problem. Well, okay, you know, when we talk about federal income taxes, the rich earn about 18% of all income in America. The top 1% earns about 18% of all income in America, uh, which is, you know, you can say it's disproportionate, certainly. They pay 38% of all federal income taxes. So, you know, maybe they do pay their fair share. Well, let's go back over there. Um, how about if Warren Buffett only paid as much as his secretary, that would solve everything? Well, maybe, maybe, you know, I could go on again, I could go on all day about why Warren Buffett really does pay more than his secretary, but I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is that people in Washington think too small. We need somebody in Washington who will think huge. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> not going there. Okay. So I'm going to make a modest proposal. Instead of raising taxes on the rich by a little bit, let's take it all. Let's go out and confiscate every penny that every rich person in America made last year. And by rich, I mean the top 1%. Everybody who made more than $350,000 last year. We're going to take it all. And that's going to solve our problem, right? Well, all right. This center box right here, that's $19.5 trillion in national debt. This box here, that's a hundred trillion dollars that we really owe. And way down here, that's everything that everybody in America who earned more than three hundred fifty thousand last year earned. You're not getting there from here, folks. You're simply not going to raise taxes on the rich a little bit and solve your problems with the debt. In fact, and these numbers 
but I don't have recent numbers on this. this. These numbers are about five years old, so figure they've got to be worse since then. But as of five years ago, if you wanted to solve the national debt by raising taxes, assuming we never created